Good morning. Need to make a slight adjustment. Okay. As we begin this morning, I would like to point out that the uh, purpose of our messages for these three weeks is to kind of give us an, an overview of the book of Ephesians. It's so important to understand the book when you begin to read it, because if you don't understand what its overall purpose is, then when you begin to read it, you'll pull verses out of context and, and make them say things that they're not uh, meant to say. I mentioned last week our overall uh, outline for the study was taken from Watchman Nee's book, Sit, Walk, Stand. Our position in Christ, we're seated in Christ. As a result of that, we walk in a certain way, and as a result of that, we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. My proposition for this study is that correct theology, a lot of people don't like theology, but theology is important. What is theology? Theology is a study of God. It's who is God. And in response to that, who should we be in light of who he is and what he's done? For correct theology leads to uh, correct living and the ability, again, to stand against the evil one. The proper understanding of who we are in Christ leads us to a deeper love for the Lord and thus reminds us of the words that I mentioned last week and have mentioned a thousand times uh, from the book entitled, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Beloved, that is the essence of Christianity. Christianity is not me getting out of hell and going to heaven. It's not Jesus coming to earth to save me so that I can go to heaven and I can enjoy all of his blessings. It is the purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to take away my sins and to make me to be a holy being, a saint, a holy one, in which the spirit of the living God can live. And then out of our innermost beings, as Jesus said, and we repeated last week, out of our innermost beings will flow rivers of living water or the reflection of the living God. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means that we come to love him and set our love and affection upon him first. Now, we love many things, as we mentioned last week, but the worth and the excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. What do I love most? What is the most important thing in my life? It should be Jesus Christ and him only. And then he will give us the desires of our hearts. He will give us things to enjoy, but we need to keep him first. Otherwise, the things that we enjoy will get in the way. Our major goal in life should be to know Jesus better and to love him more. Last week, we looked at the proposition of who we are in Christ. We said that we were chosen we were chosen before the foundation of the world. The Lord looked into this great orphanage called the world, and he chose you, and he chose me, and he chose individuals to come to him and to find grace in him and to find forgiveness in him. It was God who determined this. We were uh, predetermined to be adopted sons according to his good pleasures, it was God who determined who he was going to adopt. It wasn't me. There's no one on the face of the earth who loves and seeks the Lord apart from the grace of God. God chose according to his good pleasures and according to those who would respond to his grace. Now, how do you put that together? I don't know. It's an antinomy. It's two truths. God chose me. He looked into the orphanage of the world, but at the same time, it was in relation to the response that came out of my heart towards his grace. Those who cried out for mercy. Listen to what uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places. That's, that's a mind-boggling thought that I am seated with Christ in heaven today already so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What we have today is nothing compared to what is going to be in the age to come. When the heavens part and Jesus comes and establishes his eternal state here in the new heavens and the new earth in which we will dwell forever in peace and joy and harmony, I don't have a clue what that looks like. And you don't have a clue what that looks like. But I know it will be a glorious time for we'll live in the presence of God. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves is a gift from God. Remember the two sinners on the cross beside Jesus? The two responses? Every single individual on the face of the earth has seen some degree of grace, general grace through the revelation of the world itself, the greatness of the world, shows us that there has to be a God. And how we respond to that through the grace of God is I don't fully understand. But on the cross beside Jesus, there were two criminals. One of the criminals, the scripture says, blasphemed him and said, are you not the son of Christ? Oh, excuse me. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. In a mocking way, he said, you've been saying who you are. Now, sh prove to me who you are. Save yourself and save us. But the other one on the other side cried out for mercy. He recognized his sinfulness. And he recognized the grace. How? I don't know but the spirit of the living God ministered to him. The other one cried out for mercy, acknowledging his sinfulness, and said, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, he says. He cried out for mercy and for grace. Have you come to the place in your life where you recognize your sinfulness and cried out for mercy and for grace? Finally, we saw last week that we have been redeemed from his blood, and we asked, redeemed from what? Redeemed from our deadness, our state of spiritual deadness. Christ redeemed us from that and gave us life that will flow out of our innermost being. We're redeemed from the wrath of God. Someday, or I shouldn't say someday, we look around us today, and we see manifestations of the wrath of God in our nation today. God is lifting his hand of grace. It's only the grace of God that keeps this world from going immediately to hell in a handbasket. Now, that's not a very good thing for the pastor to say, maybe. But that's the truth. God, by his grace, suppresses the evil in this world. He's blessed this nation for 200 years. But this nation in general, and even much of the church of Christ today has rejected his grace and his mercy. And they're living for themselves. Turn on the TV and listen to what you hear from the preachers of the pulpits in America today. What do they talk about? How to raise your families. How to have the most out of life. How to get the best today. The biggest known preacher in America today says, we have our best now. Well, if this is our best now, Lord, please help us. Our best is yet to come. And because uh, this is taking place, because God is lifting his hand of grace and mercy from this nation and allowing evil and foolish, foolish thinking to go forward. And we're redeemed, but we're redeemed to walk with the Lord and before the Lord. We must ask ourselves this morning, what does a walk with God and before God look like. Let us begin by reading a portion of the scripture this morning. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, 
with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep unity, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Our Father, we ask this morning that as we continue to consider your words, that by your grace you would speak mercifully into our hearts. Help us to understand that which the Spirit desires to say to us. Give anointing to the words that go forth and give anointing to the hearts that we that hear, Father. Give us hearts to hear this morning what it is you desire to say to us. For we seek it in order to glorify you and to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask it. Amen. Our walk with the Lord. Let us not forget our proposition that if we know who we are in Christ, it will affect the way we walk. I see Christians quote Christians all the time, and, and I'm absolutely amazed at the way they live. For they say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe he's my Savior, but they live like the devil. And that's not the way it should be. If I believe in Jesus, and if Jesus dwells in my heart, he's doing a work of transformation. He's transforming us. As we learned last week, it's a metamorphosis. He's transforming us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's not taking place, beloved, we should question our salvation. Because three times I walked, quote, to the, to the altar and asked Jesus to save me. And the first two times it didn't take. I don't know why, but it didn't. But I can remember praying and asking Jesus. And I remember the third time I came forward and spoke with the pastor, and I said, I've come to rededicate my life to Christ, but when I began to look at my life from the past, I thought, I'm not rededicating my life to Christ. It was at that day that Christ changed me and remolded me. There's many today who think because they prayed the sinner's prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. They believe that that makes them a Christian. And that is generally the way God uses to do that, to make us a Christian. But at the same time, if we become a Christian, it's a transformation of life. God begins a work of grace, molding and shaping us into the person he wants us to be. Our walk with the Lord, our walk with, the, with God is to be worthy of the calling as sons and daughters of God. It's a worthy walk. What does it look like? Well, he says in, in, uh, in the verses I read for us earlier, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of your calling. To walk worthy of your calling. Walk in, in light of the calling that God has called us. What has he called us to be? Sons and daughters of God. We all look at our children, our sons, our daughters, and hope that they will reflect the good part of our lives, not the bad part. Very often they reflect the bad part. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> I have to guard myself. But we, we hope and pray that they will reflect the, the good parts of our lives, especially if we're believers. And Jesus exhorts us to, to walk worthy, to reflect his, and we'll see in a few minutes that we are to reflect his image. And he goes on and says, with which you have been called with all humility. With all humility. We stand before God, and we stand before God humbly. We stand before each other humbly. Why? Because naturally, what are we? We're, we're, quote, nothing but dirt. We were formed out of dirt. We were sinful dirt. But God touched us. It's not because I was good that God chose me. So I walk humbly before my God, acknowledging his work, his grace, his mercy, and therefore, I present my body as a living sacrifice to him and say, Lord, take me, use me, do with me what you want. I humbly come before you. I bow before you. That is the essence of the meaning of worship, beloved. You've heard me say it a thousand times. The first mention of worship in the scriptures was when Abraham said, the, son, the boy and I will go yonder and worship. 
And what was he about to do? To sacrifice his son that he had waited for 35 years or something like that to gain. And he was going to sacrifice him. That's worship. Worship is taking those things that are valuable to me and presenting them to God and say, you take them. You use them. If you want to take them away, take them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Walking humbly before our God, walking in gentleness and kindness, as we'll see in a, a little bit. Walking in gentleness before God, before God and before people. Dealing gently with people. If you're like I am, and I'm a miserable sinner, you look around you and you condemn other people and you're quick to, to, to strike out instead of dealing gently and kindly and encouraging, the, encouraging them in the things of Christ and trying to direct their paths in the right direction and in patience. And we'll hit on that again in a few minutes. Our walk with God is according to our spiritual gifts. I'm not going to say too much about this because Pastor Doug mentioned it a few weeks ago in one of the messages. I don't remember if it was in here or in the, uh, uh, in the prayer meeting. But Ephesians 4.11, he says, and he, gave, uh, and he gave gifts, and he gave, excuse me, and he gave some gifts as apostle and, and some as, as prophets and, and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers uh, to equip the saints for the work of service to build up the body of Christ. We have been gifted, many people have been gifted, and we're all gifted in different ways. Some people have been gifted as apostles. Now, let's, let me make this clear, as Pastor Doug did a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> there, there's a difference between apostles and apostles, okay? Now, let me explain. The, there were the 12 apostles, and it was those 12 op apostles who became the foundation with Christ. Christ is the foundation of the church, but they're the ones that founded the church because it was Paul and Peter and James who spoke forth the word of God and it was written down and that's what we have today. And in that sense, there are no prophets today. There's nobody who speaks new truth today, beloved, okay? Because if they do and they say they're a prophet, let's make another chapter at the end of the scriptures. And we can't do that. But at the same time, there are those people, for the word apostle means the messenger, a messenger. God sent out messengers. Let me read you a couple of passages of scriptures. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you as for your brothers. They are messengers of the church to the glory of Christ. The same word is used there as apostle. It's translated messenger there instead of apostle, not so that people are not confused, but it actually means a messenger. Again, in Philippians 2.25, but I regard it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is uh, also your messenger and minister to, to my needs. He's a messenger, and God sends out messengers today. Some of those messengers are, are missionaries. I like to look at missionaries as messengers. He takes out of the church and he raises up special people and, and he sends them out. Out of our church here, Dave and Denise. He sent out. And he's used them and he's still using them. Though she did not come directly from our church, but she grew up in this church, it was uh, Amanda. She went off as a messenger. A messenger of what? A messenger of God's word to take it. The same Greek word that's used for apostle. And then there's prophets. Again, we have to uh, make it clear. There are prophets in the Old Testament who were, again, who spoke the words of God. And those words were written down, especially in the Old Testament. They spoke forth. Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, they were the prophets of God, and their words are written down. In relation to that, there are no prophets today. But at the same time, there are prophets in the sense that there are those who speak forth the words of God. 
the words that are written in the scripture. And God anoints certain people with a special power about them that's unique and different than, than, than many preachers today. And they have a, quote, prophetic message as they speak forth the word of God with great power. I thought back this week over the last 50 years that I've been a believer. <laughs> I remember the old preacher from Jugtown, I think it was North or South Carolina. His name was Vance Havner. I don't know if any of you ever heard him. Uh, he was a powerhouse. You just never knew what he was going to say and what he was going to do. He was a character, to say the least. I don't want to get him confused. If I think he was, uh, well, anyway, he would be interested. He would be preaching the word of God, and he would walk down the aisle of the church, and he'd look at somebody, and he'd point at them, say, what about you? What about your life? Does it line up with the things that God says? And there was a power about him. He could get away with that. The average preacher couldn't, because next week they wouldn't be there if you said that and embarrassed him publicly. But he was a powerhouse. And then there was A.W. Tozer, Dr. Tozer, written many books, and he spoke prophetically into the situations in our world at that time. I think that was in the 60s, 70s. I can't remember. And there's one that today named John MacArthur. I guess I didn't get enough sleep this week. <laughs> Sorry. John MacArthur, he speaks prophetically, beloved. He stands against the world and cares not what happens to himself. He wrote an open letter to the governor of California and basically told him he was an imbecile and got away with it. He was sued and he took his stance against the government and he won and the government ended up paying the church millions of dollars instead of them paying millions of dollars. He speaks prophetically, unique, different than most of us today. And then there are evangelists, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, people that God has gifted to speak uh, to, often to masses of people. And as he speaks to the masses of people, God does a, a, a marvelous work of calling people out, calling them unto himself. Those are the gifts that are given to the church to prepare the church. And then there's pastors and teachers, those of us who are gifted weekly to stand here and to seek to teach the word of God in such a way as to impact the lives of God's people so they can do the work of the ministry. And what is the work of the ministry? It is to reflect Christ to the world. That's the ministry. To put it in a Dangerous way, we're, we're little Christ. Now, please don't misunderstand me, okay? But we are to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. When we deal with people, they're to see a difference between us. And they're to come and say, what makes you tick? Why are you the way you are? They make fun of me down at the bus station. Call me... Uh, father this and, and rabbi, they call me all kinds of names, mockingly. But I tell them every morning, it's okay. I'm praying for you, and especially you, and especially you, because you're the worst of the bunch. <laughs> and the others laugh. <laughs> anyway, w we are to, to stand as a light in a dark world. But if we are just like the world, how can we be a light? If we hide the light under a basket... How will the world see? How will the world be saved? Why is our nation going to you know where in a handbasket? Because we're hiding the light. Because we're more interested and worried about my life today. We're more worried about politics and football and everything else than we are about the things of Christ. Saints do the work of manifesting the body of Christ to the world. All of this points us to a walk uh, with the Lord, but it does not end there. 
Our walk with the Lord is to be an expression of our being a new creation. For the sake of time, because I can't go very far with this, uh, because you can see the clock marching on. We skipped one song, not for that, but anyway, we skipped one song to give a little, and it provides a little more time, but uh, I will try to be, be brief. But I really don't care, because like I said last week, you can't fire me. <laughs> a new creation. A new creation. That's what we are, beloved. Let me read for you these verses. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. He said, don't walk like the rest of the world in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their minds, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. They have, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Those who taught you about Christ didn't teach you about Christ that you continue to live as in the old way. If indeed, he said, you heard and were taught in him just as truth is in Christ, to, to lay aside in reference to your former conduct, the old ways, the old man. Lay aside the old ways. Don't walk in the old ways, beloved. Walk in the newness of life, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Are we being renewed in the spirit of our mind, beloved? Are we seeking Christ, as Pastor Doug says, week after week after week? How do we seek him? We seek him by fellowshipping together. We, uh, let me back up. We seek him first by reading the word. Let me ask you, how many chapters of the Bible or verses of the Bible have you read this week? Do you really think you're going to be changed into the image of Christ if you don't look at the image of Christ, which is the word of God? Do you think you can be transformed by watching the evening news or The View or some foolishness on TV? Though I like to watch TV, don't misunderstand me. But if we do not take time to, to, to seek him, we cannot be like him. By the renewing of our mind, and you put on the new man, which is in the likeness of God, has been, uh, has been created. We're a new creature in Christ. And as we feed our souls... He will transform us. He will change us. So it's through the word of God that he speaks. It's through fellowship together that he speaks. It's through our time of prayer that he speaks. This week I've been seeking the Lord, and it, it just amazes me how the Lord puts these messages together. I don't sleep well at night, and so I have, I think it's 200 of, of uh, Alistair Beggs, who's one of my heroes, a, a prime hero, he and John MacArthur, but uh, I have about 200 of his sermons, and I start out somewhere near where it left off last night, and it sits on my stand beside my bed and plays his sermons all night, and I wake up in the middle, and I catch a few things, and I go back to sleep. I wouldn't tell him that he puts me to sleep every night, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it unclouds my mind and, and lets me fall to sleep. But it's amazing when I wake up, in the morning, the things that I remember and some of the things that have influenced what I'm trying to say to us here this morning. What does this newness of, of life look like? Well, again, in Ephesians 4, he who steals, steal no longer. I used to be a terrible thief. <laughs> I was in a motorcycle gang. I was the treasurer of the motorcycle gang. And, and I held the bag, and I'd get them all drunk and get them to put money in the bag, and they wouldn't remember what they put in, and I'd take it out and put it in my pocket. If they'd caught me, they would have killed me, probably, literally. And then God changed me. I'm told all the time not to use myself as an illustration, but anyway, it's the one I know the best. God changed me, and since I've been a believer... I've handled hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for people. I mentioned about being a motorcycle gang treasurer and stealing the things, and, 
And Denise McCarthy was sitting right there. And the day before, they had signed my name on all their accounts, and there was thousands and thousands of dollars, and they were going off to Africa. And after the service, she came up, and she said, why didn't you tell us about that before that you were a thief? And every month, I sent them a statement accounting for every penny of money that came and went and, and, and where it went. And she said, you don't need to do that. Dave's, a, Dave's an accountant. He wouldn't do that. I said, I'm going to do that because I want you to know exactly what's going on. And by God's grace, by God's grace, I was able to handle the money. Now I'm the treasurer in the, in the airplane group. I never told them that I was a thief because they wouldn't understand. <laughs> and they probably would fire me, which wouldn't be a bad idea. Anyway, he who steals, steal no longer. But do what? But, but labor and perform with, uh, your, with your hands what is good so that you will have something to share with others. Instead of being a thief, God changes our heart and we desire to share what God has given us with other people. That's transformation of life, beloved. Let no unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth, but only such as is good and will build up what is needed so that uh, it will give to those who hear uh, no unwholesome words. <laughs> I've mentioned again and again about uh, uh, going to, to work as a bus driver. I go in there in the morning and, and the language is just terrible and, and they watch me. I play pool on Wednesday nights with uh, some guys that, that their vocabulary is not exactly the most edifying in the world. And every time they tell some kind of a joke and then they look at me to see what, how I'm going to respond. And I told them, as I tell the people at the bus, my language used to be much worse than yours, much worse. But by God's grace, he took away the unwholesome talk and gave me words to speak to edify their lives and the lives of those I come in contact with. I wish I could say that I've never said things that were unedifying, <laughs> which would be a lie. <laughs> but as, as a general pr principle, God changes us. He doesn't make us perfect, but he does a work of grace, a continuous work of grace that goes on and on and on, and then he says, and do not grieve the spirit of the Lord. That's so important, beloved. The way we live our lives, the Holy Spirit will never leave us, but he'll go to sleep. I'm not sure that's good biblical terminology. He'll not go to sleep. If you live your life in a way that is improper, he'll stop working. I told you, Many times, most of you, a lot of you are new. Maybe you haven't heard the story, I don't remember. But I, when I preached in the first little church in the backwoods of Maine, and I preached a sermon about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the lady in the church who was the most spiritual lady in the church was Pentecostal and Baptist. She was half Baptist and half Pentecostal. And when I made fun of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Like that, the switch turned off. She never heard another word I said the rest of the time I was there. On Sunday mornings, I would stand in the pulpit, dry and empty, with nothing to say, and weep. You obviously see it didn't start now. And weep. And the old people in the church would say, when your spirit dries up, you need to fall on your face before God. Wise old guy, old deacon, 87 years old. It's actually the wife of the husband of the woman I offended. God went to sleep. The Holy Spirit went to sleep. A year later, when I apologized her, to her publicly, the spirit came back, and the anointing came back. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit, beloved. We're in a world of hurt. Along with this, let us consider our last point this morning. And that is our walk before God is to be and is an imitator of our God. Again, God builds these messages together. The other night I read the scripture. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been, it has not been manifest as yet 
what we will be. We know that when he is manifest, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. That's a principle. When Christ appears, we're going to be like him. And beloved, as he unveils himself to us now, we will be more and more like him. That's Christianity. Christianity is not getting saved to go to heaven instead of hell. It's getting cleaned up so God the Holy Spirit can manifest the life of Christ within us. And he says, and everyone who has this hope fixes on him and fixes on him purifies himself just as he is pure. And so we imitate him. We seek to be, to be like him. Let me read for you these five verses. We won't spend much time on them. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, but sexually impure, excuse me, but sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as a proper as is proper among saints. No filthy and foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give the giving of thanks. For this is, this print is too small, I need to make it bigger. <laughs> For this you know with certainty that no one uh, sexually immoral or impure or greedy or who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. As Alistair Begg says, you are, in, are intelligent people. You can read down through that list and you can figure it out for yourself. It's as plain as the nose on your face. But I want to take a few moments to focus in on this one verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. God, if we're going to imitate God, God is love. At the same time, God is holy, and his holy indignation can strike out. And I have the tendency to strike out with indignation as well, but most of the time, my indignation is not holy. I say to myself and to each of us, allow God to deal with the indignation, and let us spend our time seeking to love one another and love those around us. How do we define love? Where do you find the definition for love? Where in particular? Yes, 1 Corinthians 13. That is the definition. It's where we find the definition. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Does not brag. Is not puffed up. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account the wrong suffered. <coughs> Excuse me. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. As I mentioned a moment ago, I never cease to be amazed how God puts these messages together. Yesterday morning I woke up just as Alistair Begg was speaking on walk in love and speaking on this passage in particular. He said there's 15 facets of love. His message, I listened to it, it was in two parts. It took 80 minutes. You want me to give you the message? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. It took him 80 minutes. He spoke about love being the diamond of all the fruits of, of God. And it has 15 facets, and we don't have time to go over those 15 facets, but there's a couple of things that we need to be reminded of. <coughs> uh, need to skip ahead here a bit. Uh, the, well, I can't find, I can remember it anyway. Uh, the, the, the 15 facets, in, in, in the language of, of the English, are different parts of speech, but in the Greek, Every single one of them are, are a verbal form. They are verbs. 
They have verbs, and they're in the present continuous state. So love is not something we, we uh, that, that is, it, it's, it's not something that we think about. It's something that we do. These facets of love is something that we, that we do because they're in verbal form. And it's presence continuous. It means that it begins in our lives and it continues day after day after day after day after day in a habitual manner. Thirdly, reminded to these facets of love that are, are, were all present in, in the life of Christ. Alistair pointed out this, I never entered my head before, that you can take each one of those facets and replace it with the name of Jesus. Jesus is, if I can find it, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is not jealous. Jesus does not brag, etc. Now, I can't put my name in there. Peter is patient. That would be a half lie. Sometimes I'm patient, sometimes I'm not. But that's the work that God is seeking to do in our lives. I just want to hit on two or three of these and then we're done. Love is patient. This simply means that God has a long fuse. Do you have a long fuse? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. We're to be imitators of God and God has a long fuse or you and I would all be dead. Amen? If he dealt with me with impatience, he would have wiped me off the face of the earth a long time ago, even as a believer, because I mess things up all the time, just as you mess things up all the time. But it's, it's amazing to, to read, especially the Old Testament. You read the book of Judges. I've been listening to the Old Testament again as I on my way to work and on my way home from work. And, and you, you, you listen to judges, the cycles, the cycles. God raises up a judge. He delivers the people. As soon as the judge is off the scene, what happens? They slide backwards again. And then they cry out for mercy. And God mercifully raises up somebody else and rescues them again. And that goes over and over and over. I think it's seven times, seven cycles. Read the, the uh, Psalm 107 and see how often the people failed. And when they failed and things went south, they'd cry out to God for mercy and he would meet them and be merciful to them. Patience is long-suffering. God is long-suffering. You need to be long-suffering. I need to be long-suffering and kind. Love is kind. Love reacts with kindness towards those who mistreat us. You know, it's easy to be kind to people that are nice, right? But it's not so easy to be kind. We have one of our neighbors who's constantly complaining about everything. Everything. He says, we're a bunch of trailer trash. He, he leads the, the troop, but that's okay. <laughs> and, and it's difficult to be kind when he's grumbling and complaining all the time. You've heard me say before, when the neighbor throws garbage over your fence, what do you do? You go over and mow his lawn. Kind. Be kind to those people. Perfect example, the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans were hated people by the Jews. The Jew was laying in the gutter, beaten from the robbers. The priest walked by. All the righteous ones walked by. And the Samaritan, who was the hated one, came and picked him up and put him on his donkey, took him to the inn and paid all the bills. He was kind. God is kind. Jesus is kind. And we are to be kind. And finally, this morning, love does not seek its own. I wanted to leave this one out, but I couldn't. This is the one probably I hate the most because I'm very self-centered. If you don't believe me, ask my family. They'll tell you, especially my wife. <laughs> uh, I like the quote that Alistair had yesterday morning from a tombstone. Listen to this. He often quotes from tombstones. He spends time walking through graveyards. Strange. But anyway, uh, here lies a miser who lived for himself and, carried f and cared for nothing but gathering wealth. Now, where is he? Or how does he fare? Nobody knows and nobody cares. That's powerful. That's a good thing to put on a tombstone. A miser. Thought about himself, what he could get. And in the end, when he died, he died all alone. We had one of those in my hometown. 
She ran a little store. Kids would come in with a nickel, and she'd give them four cents worth of candy because they didn't know any different. She was a miser. Sad. On her daughter's wedding day, they got in a fight, and she chased her down the street and tore her wedding dress off in her. I don't think her daughter ever spoke to her again. She died, a miser, miserable, all alone. If we pour our lives unselfishly into the lives of others, when we pass, we'll have those who have a heavy heart, who care. True love is always unselfish. That's easy to say, but difficult to live. Amen? Not only in a selfless way, but as people who walk worthy of his calling. Excuse me. We're not only to be selfless in our, in our walk, but we're to walk worthy of our calling. We're to walk in newness of life, and we're to walk as imitators of God. Amen? Let's stand for closing prayer. Our Father, it's easy, relatively speaking, to stand here and to speak these words. Help us, Father, help each of us to hear what the Spirit is seeking to say to the church. Transform our hearts and our lives according to your word. Make us to be imitators of you as we walk before this world, that we might be a light shining in the darkness. And as you empower us, Father, to do that, we'll be very, very careful to give you the thanksgiving and the praise, for it comes not from ourselves, but from you. So as we depart now and go our separate ways, we ask that you go with us, that you empower us, you lead us, and you use us, Father, for your honor and your glory. For we ask it once again in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people would say, Amen. Have a blessed day.